Hello, welcome to the EPG Patshala program in linguistics. I am Pramod Pandey, Center for Linguistics, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Today we are going to discuss module 23. The title is Problems in Phonemic Analysis. The main objectives of the present module are to make students familiar with the problems in phonemic analysis and prepare them for a background to the development of generative phonology. The problems of phonemic analysis are multiple. The strict adherence to the principles of phonemic analysis, the classical view of the phoneme, and some of these principles such as phonetic similarity, <coughs> sufficient contrast, separation of levels, all these issues which characterize structural phonology have come to be questioned because they have proved to be problematic. So we'll take a look at them one by one. The two basic notions that inform phonemic analysis are the notions of sufficient contrast, significant contrast, and phonetic similarity. Both the notions are not entirely satisfactory as we see. Let's take a look at the problem with significant contrast. The notion of contrast is at the basis of the principle of contrastive analysis, which helps us to establish two phonetically similar sounds as phonemes on the basis of their distribution. When they occur in identical environments and the substitution of one with the other brings about a change in meaning, then the two sounds in question are phonemes. These are contrasting segments. What we notice is that in languages, phonemes do not always occur in contrastive contexts. Sometimes it is difficult to find two phonemes to have identical or similar environments. For example, in English, we have two sounds, h and ng. Now, these are phonetically similar, but they do not ever occur in similar environments. For example, H occurs mostly at the beginning of syllables in the onset position, whereas Ng occurs at the end of syllables in the coda position. Now, H and Ng are thus in different environments, and thus they can never be shown to be really contrasting. Now, what is it that makes us see H and Ng as contrasting segments. So I will revise this one with examples. For example, H occurs at the beginning of syllables in the onset position and Ng occurs at the end of syllables. The examples are given on the screen. Him, hat, behave, sing, banker, England. We notice that H always is at the beginning of a syllable and Ng always is at the end of the syllable. What is it that makes us conclude that H and Ng are phonemes? It is the notion of phonetic similarity. Another example where the notion of distribution is problematic comes from allophones in, in languages. For example, we have looked at the Congo alternations of the sa, za, and sa, sh, and z. When we look at the environments, we notice the following. Notice that the allophones, allophone ch, occurs before e. We thus conclude that ch is an allophone of the because the never occurs before e. Similarly, S never occurs before E, but Sh occurs before E. And Z never occurs before E, but Z occurs before E. On the basis of the distribution, we conclude that T and Ch are allophones. But when you look closely at the distribution, what you find is that it is not only Ch which occurs in complementary distribution with T, but is also sh which occurs in complementary distribution with 
factor. And similarly, it is also je which occurs in complementary distribution with the. It is thus the notion of complementary distribution <coughs> is not going to be very helpful for us. How do we decide, however, that je is the allophone of the and it is not she which is an allophone of the. The, <coughs> uh, the notion that is, plays a crucial role here is that of phonetic similarity. The assumption is that che is phonetically closer to the than she is to the. Che is closer to se and je is closer to the. And that is how we assume that che, she and the are allophones of the, se and the. Now, the notion of phonetic similarity itself is not such a clearly defined notion. For example, when we look at the relationship between the, ch, and ch, which of these sounds are closer to each other, one another? <clears throat> According to the data from Congo, it appears that ch is the being the allophone of the is closer phonetically to the, and that <coughs> sir is not phonetically close to the. However, we find that in many languages, it is sir which may be closer to the rather than the being closer to the. For example, in Assamese, we have a general uh, change taking place. <coughs> The sound ch which is found in other Indo-Aryan languages has changed to s. Thus, s and ch are phonetically close to each other. <coughs> in some languages, such as Awe, it is s which becomes ch, the opposite of the process in Assamese. Thus, <coughs> the notion of phonetic similarity does not seem to be very well defined. Another problem with the notion of phonetic similarity is that sometimes not only sounds which appear to be phonetic similar, but sometimes sounds which are phonetically dissimilar or remotely similar are found to be allophones of one another. Thus, look at the data on your screen. In Chokri spoken in Nagaland and Manipur, the post-alveolar approximant ra freely varies with the voiced velar fricative r. So r and r are allophones. And we find that r and r are quite different from each other, much more, uh, much farther away than s and ch. Then in many languages, the sounds, the consonants p, t, d, k, g, her, any of them are <clears throat> have the allophone glottal stop. Now, if the sounds <clears throat> are glottal stop and these consonants are not phonetically very similar. For example, if p is and if p and the glottal stop are allophones and g and glottal stops are also allophones. D and the glottal stop are also allophones. The notion of phonetic similarity does not seem to be very clearly understandable here. It is thus difficult to say precisely when two sounds can be said to be phonetically similar and when not. One basic assumption with phonemic analysis is that the phonemic systems are monosystematic. By rec taking recourse to the principles of phonemic analysis, we arrive at the phonemes of a language. However, what we find is that languages are constantly evolving, constantly changing. They come in contact with other languages, and thus they come to evolve systems of which are multiple, which are many. For example, new sounds can come to emerge. Now, those sounds do not have the same kind of distribution as the sounds which are already established in the language. So, phenomena such as contact and historical change may give rise to systems which are not monosystematic,
but which are polysystematic. Let us take a look at some examples. Hindi has the uh, sounds, sorry, Hindi has the consonant k as a borrowing from uh, Perso Arabic and also the vowel o as a borrowing from English. What we notice is that k actually freely varies with k in the speech of most speakers of Hindi. Similarly, the vowel o as in ball freely varies in the speech of some speakers of Hindi. It is thus not quite possible to propose that k is as much of a phoneme as let us say k is or o is as much of a phoneme as for example a is. Certainly they are phonemes but there seem to be, seems to be a difference in the way these sounds function in the language. We have examples of phonemic systems which are very clearly monosystematic, but we also have examples of systems which are polysystematic. We thus have consonant systems in a language such as Punjabi, which seems to be have multiple systems within it. So there are consonants which are marginal consonants and there are consonants which are not so marginal consonants. Similarly with vowels, let's take a look at the system of fricatives in two languages, Santali and Punjabi. Santali has three fricatives, sa, sha, and ha, an alveolar, a retroflex, and a glottal, voiceless fricative. Punjabi, however, seems to have seven fricatives. Three of them are regular, they contrast, but four of them have marginal status. What this means is that they may or may not be used in contrast with other sounds of the language. When they are used, they are phonemes. When they are used freely with other sounds, they are not phonemes. For example, the, the <coughs> phoneme kh can be freely varying with the phoneme k. Similarly, g may be freely varying with the phoneme g. Thus, kh and g are only marginally phonemic because it is only in the speech of some speakers that they contrast. There are some well-known cases of problems in phonemicization in languages. What we find is that the principles of phonemic analysis are not always helpful in resolving certain issues. For example, given a diphthong, do we consider it as a single vowel or do we consider it as a sequence of two vowels? Given certain sounds, certain consonants, such as aspirated consonants like ma, na, do we consider them as single consonants, aspirated nasals, or do we consider them as sequences of a nasal plus a glottal fricative, her? Huh. These are some of the problems that seem to be not easily resolvable. However, the phonologists have tried to find a recourse to the, to the solutions of these problems. For example, in some languages, the data have to be so interpreted that we are able to conclude about the phonemic significance of the sounds as, for example, diphthongs or sequences of vowels or as complex segments or as two segments together. For example, let's take a look at the vowel sequences versus diphthongization problem. So in some languages, it is somewhat less difficult to decide whether a sequence of vowels is a sequence or it's a diphthong. Similarly, whether complex consonants are com a single consonants or a, or a combination of two consonants. Let's look at some of these data for diphthongization. Sorry, diphthongs. 
In Garo, a diphthong occurs with the hiatus, that is, absence of a break. But in a vowel sequence, a glottal stop is inserted. Thus, my means what? But hi a means break. In the word my, I is a diphthong, but in the word break, ia is a sequence of two vowels. So, Garo very clearly distinguishes between diphthongs and sequence of vowels. But remember, not all languages do. In Koiren, we have another kind of evidence to decide on the issue. For example, in Koiren, stress falls on the final syllable. In Koiren, we find another kind of example which helps us to decide whether it is a sequence of two vowels or a diphthong. In Koiren, a syllable which is, occurs in the final position is stressed. What we find is that if it is a diphthong, then the stress falls on the first vowel. But if it is a sequence of two vowels, then the stress falls on the second vowel, as we notice here in the two examples. Oche, to dig, but ori ek means fat and grease. Now, ea clearly is a sequence of two vowels, and a is a diphthong in koiren. Again, to repeat, it is not always the case that languages actually are able to distinguish between diphthongs and sequences of vowels. So this remains, this remains a problem in phonemic analysis. The other issue related to this problem is that of complex segments. In languages such as Hindi, we have aspirated nasals, ma, ha. We also have aspirated plosives, for example, pa, bha, ta, dha, etc. Now, when it comes to the nasals, it is not very certain whether we should treat the aspirated nasals, also the aspirated lateral as a single phoneme or a complex of two phonemes. The evidence that can be brought to bear here is the distribution. When we look at the distribution of the sounds, what we find is, whereas all the aspirated plosives occur in the medial, final, and initial positions, the aspirated nasals and lateral occur only in the medial position. They are not found to occur word initially or word finally. Quite clearly then, it can be concluded that the aspirated nasals and aspirated lateral, because of having very restricted distribution, are actually sequences of two consonants, the nasals and the lateral ma, na, la, and the plus and her. When the two come together, we have the aspirated nasals and laterals here. In the language Magar, we have a very clear way of distinguishing aspirated nasals from nasals followed by uh, an edge. For example, we have words such as kalha, climbed, which is uttered with the without any <coughs> break between the lateral and the aspirate. And in the word lang ha, village, we have a clear break between the nasal ma and the aspirate ha. Again, this is a very special situation. In most other languages, it is not possible for us to find a separation between the nasal and lateral or sonorants in general and the aspirated uh, consonants or the glottal aspirated consonant, sorry, or the glottal her. The notion of the phoneme as a contrastive unit was adhered to so strictly that structural phonologies sometimes 
fail to see phonemes and natural classes. This led to a difficulty in arriving at generalizations which could be stated in the forms of rules. For example, in module 18, we looked at the Tamil rule of voicing. Change to b, d, d, j, g, following <coughs> nasals ma, na, 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 and na. <coughs> See, the sounds are given there on the screen. The rule is stated with each of the phonemes and allophones as single unit. The rule could alternatively also be stated in the form of single rules, such as per changes to ma after, per changes to ba after ma, or ter changes to da after na, etc., as you notice them on the screen. <coughs> it is thus not possible for us to see that these the, the rule actually involves a whole class of sounds. And <coughs> this was a pr problem because it was like trying to see the trees but missing the wood. So when it came to look, seeing generalizations, the notion of the phoneme as a contrastive unit and not anything beyond it kept the phonology, phonological generalizations to be not so easily statable. It is the assumption that segments that undergo a phonological rule form a natural class and not individual segments that led to the rise of distinctive features and that led to giving up the notion of individual segment, segmental phonemes. Principle of biuniqueness. One guiding principle of phonemic analysis was the principle of biuniqueness. What the principle says is that once a phoneme is related to an allophone, then you can predict what allophone the phoneme has, and from the allophone you can predict what phoneme it relates to. That is, there is one-to-one -one relationship between pho the phoneme and an allophone. Thus, the allophones of the lateral la that we looked at in an earlier module are represented in the following way. As you notice here, the phoneme la is related to the three allophones. L, O, and L. Now, looking at these three allophones, you know that each one of them is an allophone of the phoneme L. And similarly, looking at the phoneme, you know that it has three allophones. This is what was meant by by uniqueness. By uniqueness was a principle which was strictly adhered to. In reality, however, we find that the this principle of by uniqueness is difficult to adhere to. For example, in a language such as Malayalam, although the voiceless and voiced plosives pa, ba, ta, da, ta, da, ka, ga contrast with each other, but there are contexts in which the phone the voiceless phonemes become voiced phonemes. Thus, given the voiced phonemes b, d, d, j, and g, <coughs> it is not always easy to say whether they come from the phoneme b, d, d, j, g, or from the allophones b, t, t, j, g, unless we have looked at the environment. The distinction thus between the phonemes which are voiced and phonemes which are voiceless has been neutralized in Malayalam. In cases of neutralization, the principle of biuniqueness is often violated, but that is a reality. Let's to take a look at the data. Thus, in Malayalam, we have minimal pairs such as pala, bala, which means a kind of tree and child. But in the words, champa, amba, we find that 
the distinction is lost. Champa is pronounced as Chamba and Amba is also pronounced as Amba. Looking at B, we know that, <coughs> sorry, looking at B, it is not possible to tell whether the B comes from B or the B comes from P. The distinction between them is expressed in the terms of the figure that you see on the screen. There are two kinds of examples that tell us that the mixing of levels is something that cannot be avoided. One is examples of rules such as voicing in Malayalam. We find that the voicing takes place mainly in word formation. Thus, a word such as pala is pronounced bala when there is a context that is presented <coughs> with the nasal before it. For example, in Asian, Asilam pala, we hear it as pronounced as Asilam bala, a type of banyan tree. Now, the change of pa to ba is made possible because of it occurring after the morphine, Ejila. What we find in the Malayalam data is a rule, rule of voicing which applies both at the phonemic level as well as at the morphemic level. So it's a rule which is common to the phonemic component as well as to the morphological, morphophonemic component. Another, ex another example of a rule which applies in both the components is stress in English. Stress is found to apply both in individual words, individual morphemes, as well as at, in complex and compound words. So that when simple words become complex, the stress changes. Your photo, photograph, photography. In the first word, the stress is on the first syllable, it is on the first and third syllable in the next word, and it is on the second syllable in the third word, photography. So, we have the word photo also with the stress on the first syllable, and when we get a word such as photograph and photography, then also we find stress. So, the rule of stress applies from the morpheme up to complex and compound words. However, there are also cases where stress is the only cue to the difference between words which belong to two grammatical categories. Thus, stress is involved in also expressing grammatical distinction. For example, your produce versus produce. The words are different mainly in terms of the stress and the consequences of the stress. The words rebel, rebel, similarly, are different because of their stress. In the noun, the stress falls in the first syllable, and in the verb, rebel, the stress falls in the second syllable. Any differences in the realization of the vowels are on account of the vowel being stressed or unstressed. Here we have a very clear case of a phonological rule which helps make grammatical distinctions. In this module, we have looked closely at some of the problems in phonemic analysis, such as the <coughs> notions of phonetic substance and significant contrast, which are found to be insufficient, monosystematicity, phonemicization, principle of biuniqueness, and separation of levels. These are some of the issues that were found to be problematic. They were either revised or were abandoned. Interestingly, the notion of the phoneme as a contrasting unit continues to be in use even today. And thus the principles of contrastive analysis and complementary analysis and tree variation are also in use today because they help us establish these phonemes and allophones in a language which are still relevant at a certain level. We were not able to uh, discuss the notions of neutralization in great detail, which is also a very important notion and which was problematic for structural phonology. We will look at them in module number 32. 
thank you.